Good morning. Welcome. Uh, as everybody gathers and grabs their seats, uh, it's great to hear the discussion and fellowship and the sharing. And what a beautiful thing that we can come together on these mornings and just uh, continue to build. And in a way, maybe sometimes rekindle friendships and relationships and share what God's doing. But what a beautiful thing. Um, we, we, uh, we're we going to make a few little shifts in worship over the coming weeks. And a simple shift we're going to make today is we're going to move our announcements now to the very end of the service. So uh, this morning, all I'm going to ask is, and on top of welcoming you here, uh, I am glad each one of you is here. I just ask now that you take some time uh, during our prelude just to quiet your hearts, still your minds, as we each in our own way prepare ourselves for worship this morning. Hey, well, thank you. Today's call to worship is a responsive reading. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. May 
They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Come today, there's no reason 
to wait, Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born, Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness. blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing alleluia. Christ is risen. Joe, come up and help. Um, at this point in the service, you know, we, we always have a wonderful time to share what's on our hearts, our lift up our prayers and concerns and joys. And I think another uh, subtle shift we're going to begin to make in the coming weeks is we're still going to do this time as we've known it once a month. Um, but I'm working on other ways we can pray together during times of communion uh, in other emphasis during the month. So this is our day really to share uh, what's on our heart to lift up our joys and concerns and our prayers? And joy, uh, Joe has a mic. So um, if anybody has a, a, a praise, a joy, a concern they'd like to share, uh, feel free to lift that up. Three praises. Today is my 71st birthday. Ooh. Yay. <laughs> this past Thursday was Harriet and my 31st anniversary. And one of the pleasures of being on worship team, as I've mentioned before, is you stand up front, you can look out at the congregation, and I'm happy to say that we are above 30 in our number today once again. Praise the Lord. And then an unspoken prayer. Um, Barb's not with us today because uh, she traveled. Uh... Oh, you're back. Oh, I didn't see you come in. Never mind. I'll leave it for you. I have a couple this morning. One is, of course, for Marilyn. She's home. She has a sinus infection, and she's on drugs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Duke. But the other one is, uh, you may remember Mike Foster. Uh, he was the uh, homeless pastor in Ithaca. And he is really, he's bedridden almost now. 
with his back. He's supposed to have a surgery at the end of this month that's going to relieve it some. But as he says, he's in an 8 to 10 pain with threshold all the time. Good morning. Uh, I've got a couple of praises. We've got our wood all stacked and cut and split. And we have, um, also we have Sandy got through the hurricane very well. She had a lot of debris, but nothing other. She lost her electric for six hours, but she's back online. She's helping people in the neighborhood and everything else. That's a praise. My wife's got a few little problems this morning. We have some outspoken requests also. Uh, and that song, the end of that, you know, it really gets to you while you're waiting for your crown. All of us who believe knows we're going to get a crown to put at Jesus' feet when we're done. Praise God for that. Good morning. I go along with what Bob said on that song. I think with um, all the sins that Jesus took upon himself and the pain and the agony and whatever, each of us has a little bit of trouble along the way in our life, but I just got to thinking maybe that each trouble that we have was nothing compared to what Jesus went through. So put that into perspective. Anyways, um, our little grandson, Caleb, is going to be a year old the end of this month already, and it's a joy to watch him, but he wants to do everything that his five-year-old brother is doing. And holy cow. Anyways, it's hard to keep up with that kid. He walked early, and he's into everything, but at least he's able. And I thank the Lord for the two grandsons. Um, I also pray for my friend Sue. Like Bob said, that she isn't feeling too well, and... That's a couple different issues health-wise. We're praying for Kathy Hansen as well. And um, when you have a sister that has the same first name as you, it kind of, you feel a little bit more closeness there. And I have an unspoken as well. Well, I am here today, not not expecting to be. We thought our granddaughter was going to make her arrival, but she's hanging out, so uh, we'll keep you posted. I do want to, though, um, say it was a blessing to be able to go spend time with my son and his fiance and our granddaughter. Um, I'd also like to just praise God for keeping family and friends safe in Florida and priests Let's continue to pray for all those who've been affected now by two hurricanes and are just reeling from that. And also remembering those who are having difficulties this time of year with, you know, dealing with memories of lost loved ones or those who are struggling with health issues. Um, we just lift them up in prayer. Our daughter uh, lives right outside of Tampa, and uh, she gathered up uh, her her father-in-law and uh, her her son from uh, from college, and they hunkered down and they made it through the storm. Just uh, some debris in the yard, a big oak tree, but uh, they made it. Thank God for that. <coughs> <laughs> Um, let's pray for our leaders. This time of the year, uh, we have some people that are running for office and, and, and other leaders all from, from the church, local, state, national, worldwide. Pray for leaders. Pray for our nation and thank the Lord for all those that are in service, whether it's the military, police, firemen, EMTs, hospital workers, teachers, all those that are in service to us, let's thank the Lord for their servants' hearts that he's given them. I'm going to pull Paul Harvey this morning, the rest of the story. 
<clears throat> I forgot to tell you about Mike. Um, Mike can't work now. He actually has to stay home, and he's trying to watch their child. And his wife, who didn't work, has now gone to work trying to support the family. Uh, if anybody felt led to help them or send them a card, if you just contact me, I'll give you an address, and you can uh, do what you want from that point. Thank you. For Tim, uh, uh, the Johnsons, Marilyn and Mary's son, uh, he's recuperating from uh, uh, some complications, uh, and uh, pray for uh, God's uh, peace on that. And of course, uh, again, Kathy Hansen, and pray for the her, their family. And uh, we know that God is with her, and uh, that's a good place to be. But yet, uh, pray for sustaining uh, peace. Uh, and uh, being um, that uh, it's the uh, the Jewish New Year now, it's the uh, it's we are we stand on the shoulders of the uh, the prophets and prophetesses and those who went before us, and we're only here by God's grace, and that uh, we just uh, we thank Him for uh, for this church and a place to to worship, that we're dry. And pray for those that are um, uh, compromised with uh, with water, and some don't have homes. And pray for FEMA and those things. Turned on, I believe. Yes. Um, you know, so many requests, and I appreciate you all bringing what's on our hearts. You know, and even, you know, we talk sometimes of unspoken requests. The beauty is they're not unspoken before God, and God knows what's on our hearts, and God knows those situations. So we can continually, faithfully to pray in and over those situations, and so many of the situations you brought up. Um, we, we are a people that can go before our God and lift up, really, what's on our hearts. Sometimes it's raw. Sometimes it's not pretty. Sometimes it's full of praise and joy and proclamation, but some days it's just a simple cry, God help me. And what a beautiful thing that it listens to those prayers. So let's pray this morning. Dear Lord, as we just come before you lifting up these requests of our heart, we give thanks in the ways in which we have been called and invested to be in these situations. We know sometimes we stand outside, like is at a window looking in, trying to figure out how to help. So the least we can do before you, our great God, is lift these situations up in prayer, knowing that you are aware, that you are working across these situations. We ultimately pray for your will and purposes to be done. And if uh, Eva's even brought up in the request, if there's any way that you call us, lead us into these situations, to be a caring presence, an encouraging presence, a helping presence. Show us that pathway, Lord. And until that time comes, we continually, faithfully bring these things before you, uh, asking for uh, your provision, your care, your grace, your mercy, and all these things. We also lift you up in praise, Lord, giving thanks for the many, many wonderful things that uh, you do around us. And sometimes those are the things we forget about. Our, our heart, our minds go to the the things that cause hurt and pain and suffering, but we can also lift up to you those things that bring joy, that bring life, uh, that point to you, that build a picture of who you are. So we give thanks for those things and lift all this up before you in your great and holy name. Amen. Some of our shifting, and I forgot where I was at this thing. Um, we're gonna, as we bring our offerings forward, again, I'm, I'm going to offer a prayer, but what a blessing it is for us to have opportunity to share simply who we are in another way before our God. And uh, as, as I pray uh, over these offerings, as we conclude, um, we're going to stand and sing together, just simply giving thanks for who God is. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we give thanks for the blessing and opportunity we have. We know that you have provided so much for us. You've provided so much that we sometimes overlook or take for granted. 
What a blessing it is as you encourage our hearts, lead our hearts to simply give back to you what is already yours. We ask and pray that our offerings, as simple as they may seem, that you will use to your great and mighty works here in this church, in this church family, in this community, and even in the world, uh, that our simple gifts will be multiplied beyond abundance that we can even imagine or perceive. And we put, put these offerings now before you, giving thanks and honor. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise God, the Son and Holy Ghost. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. There's no need to be afraid, he's beside me.
Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds. As we hear your word proclaimed, we ask that you would change us. Help us to be more like Jesus each and every day. We ask this in his name. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from the book of Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God. Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered, because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. The sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. The sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey, and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd... And because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep, therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As the shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among the sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples, and gather them from the countries, and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture. And on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture, and they shall feed on the mountains of Israel." I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy, I will feed them in justice. For as you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. It is not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the rest of the, your pasture and to drink of clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet. And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet? The word of the Lord. Uh, perfect. All right. We're going to have Butch uh, share. A few of you may have noticed. <clears throat> when that song came on, Jesus Loves Me. Uh, 
Obviously, I wasn't prepared. <laughs> a lot of you know, some of you don't, that when Michael was five or six years old, Marilyn and I used to speak in several churches about abortion. For those of you who don't know, Michael was adopted. He, was five years old. He sang that song in every church we spoke. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Yeah, so thank thank you for sharing what's on your heart. I'll switch back. I'll get this. Um, yeah, be praying for Butch. And what a, to God to speak into your heart and have that experience, that God brought value in that song to you and uh, speaks to us in that way. So uh, what a beautiful thing. We'll be praying with you and for you today. Um, why am I up here? The sermon. Uh Wow. Uh, boy, God, God, you know, between the songs and, and Butch, what, God speaks to us in so many wonderful, wonderful ways. And in a way, that passage from Ezekiel, it was long. Okay, I'll admit it was long. But it speaks to the very fabric of the conflict between the world and Jesus. It speaks to the very fabric of, of the ways in which the world seeks to help itself in contrast to the ways that Jesus fully intends to help the world. And it, it kind of leads into my passage this morning. We've been working through John. And for those of you who have been thrilled that we've been working through the Gospel of John and you're looking towards working through the middle to the end, we are taking a pause after today. Um, I'm going to work on some other um, series uh, in the coming weeks. But today we're in John chapter 10. So if you have a Bible, want to open it, open your app, you can follow along. We are in John chapter 10. It's been a somewhat interesting few sudden uh, accumulative natural disasters. You, know, you think about what happened in Florida uh, weeks ago, then in North Carolina, and then in Florida. You know, if you watch the news, there's been some tremendous, tremendous stories of people finding themselves in a situation where they felt lost, helpless, unequipped. They have lost what they had valued. And tragically, some people lost their life. And I bring all this up not to make light of it, but there's some interesting things that we can look at here. One of the things you see is there's remarkable stories of people stepping in to help people that they had never known before. That once lives were on the line, barriers broke down. Things that became differentiations between people no longer mattered. And when life was on the line, we, we see so many stories cropping up now of people stepping into situations where they did remarkable things, sacrificial things to save other people in need. But at the same time, I saw a few stories that were heartbreaking to me where people were in situations where they really truly felt as if they received no help. Help never came. They hoped, they desired, they hoped some more, but the help that they sought never came. And I, it's undoubtedly, you know, the response has been tremendous, but it is undoubtedly clear that there's still people in these areas today without help. Even in the midst of seeing remarkable stories of assistance, provisions, and help, we know there's some people that still haven't found the help they need. And as I process what's happening in the news and in real time, these disasters, it, it thought, helped me think about this passage. We've probably heard this passage a lot. It's often called, I am the good shepherd. That's often the title of this chapter. It's a shorter chapter in the gospel of John, 
but it's a very pointed chapter. And sometimes when we hear it preached, when we look at it, when we read it, we look at it in a certain way. We look at it in a certain lens. And I'm hoping today I'm going to bring a slightly different lens to this passage. The meaning remains the same, but sometimes how we deal with that meaning changes based on the lens that we look at it. So I'm going to begin to start in uh, chapter 10, verse 1, and 1 to 3 says this, and this is the English Standard Version. Here's this phrase again. We see it over and over through the Gospel of John. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold, sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And then in verse 4, says this, 4 to 6, When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Here we are again, the religious leaders, the people are around Jesus, and as Jesus teaches, shares this word, Jesus simply says again, still they don't understand. And we often look at this from the eyes of Jesus is the shepherd. Um, we, there's pictures around the church. I notice there's one in the back and there's one in the, the back that kind of represent Jesus in this mode of caring before the one in need um, as this good shepherd. And that is so true. But as we look at these six verses, I want to share, look at some of the parts of what's being talked about. Because I sometimes I think, I wonder, if we don't focus enough on the details to realize what's being said here. The first thing I want to talk about is this idea of the sheepfold. What is a fold? It, it may be a hard thing for us to comprehend and imagine, but these sheep would gather in the valleys on the side of the mountains, and they would graze. And there was time where they needed to be protected. They needed to be gathered and protected by something in Psalm 1. And the sheepfold often was nothing more than a few piles of little rocks up in the side, tucked into a valley. And in a way, it was almost high ground on what was happening below them in the valley. So the sheep needed this place to, to go up above the commonality, the, the common life they were living out grazing and feeding, and they were brought into this place for protection. It was, it was a marked place. It was defined, but it was done, used for two reasons. One is for containment. The sheep needed to be brought together and contained so they wouldn't wander out on their own into the dangers of the world. The other thing this brought was separation. If you think about this idea of this sheepfold, it was to create a barrier and separation between the things of the world out there that were harmful and the, the, the wholesome, healthy place of rest and pasture for the evening uh, away from danger uh, for the sheep. And the other thing to remember, it was a guarded place. I've seen pictures where oftentimes it was a rock wall with a log across it, and there's no one present. But the reality was this was a guarded place where the shepherd posted himself as the gate, as the door, as the way out, as the way in. If anything was going to get into the sheepfold and harm the sheep, it had to go through the shepherd. There was not a nice wooden door that we often picture in our homes. There was not secure windows. There were not secure walls. Um, it was a very simple place, a passageway where the shepherd not only collected his sheep, but then posted himself and stood guard. And in a way, the sheepfold then became a very beautiful thing because two outcomes, yes, they were away from safety, but while they were in the sheepfold, the sheep had intimate relationship with each other. The sheep got to know each other. They were close, shoulder to shoulder, neck to neck. Probably like, hey, can you move over a little? I need a little more space. Um, 
I like to sprawl out when I sleep. But there was intimacy between the sheep. But the most important thing is there was intimacy between the sheep and the shepherd. You see that door and the gatekeeper that's being talked about here. Jesus takes two roles in this passage. He takes a role as a door, and he takes a role as a gatekeeper. The door in the language that's talked about here is for a small, singular collection of believers. So for the, the way into the fold is to pass through that door as an individual. And imagine the first face you see as you pass through that door is Jesus' face, the shepherd, the one that's meant to care for us and protect us, the person that wants to be with us. But also, as they talk about a gatekeeper here, the gatekeeper here is something the leaders are going to struggle with. See, the Jews saw saw themselves as the chosen people, and Jesus speaks into that and says, you are mistaken. You are not the only chosen people. I choose Jew and Gentile. So the gatekeeper, if you look at the constructs of the folds in this time, this might be two, three, four differing flocks gathering together, each having their own little areas in the sheepfold, but still the only way in was the single gate. The only way in was Jesus. And once they found entry, that both groups, or an intimate relationship with Jesus. So Jesus speaks to these religious leaders here. And even we see that in Ezekiel. Um, There were some problems. God speaks into them for the ways in which they've misused their role as shepherd. And in fact, the end of Ezekiel says, you have done such a poor job. I now will be the one to do it. I now am the shepherd and the gatekeeper. So the religious leaders, as they're hearing this story, their minds likely flash back to Ezekiel and that prophetic word. And here that now Jesus stands before them and says, I am that gatekeeper for both Jew and Gentile. And think about this idea of this door and gate. They're out in the valley, maybe off in the distance, they see danger, they sense danger. And they're brought, they're led into this, area of safety. What happens when we get to an area of safety? When, when we walk through life with burdens, struggles, sometimes they become daily and they add up and they wear on us and we get to that place where we can find relief, we find calm, we find peace. There's anxiety drifts away. We may be able to once again look back at our purposes and our values and the values we have with others. And in a way, that's what happens with these sheep. As they arrive up into the sheepfold, guarded by Jesus, the first face they see is the shepherd, Jesus. The people relax. It's their safe place. They find nourishment. They find care. They find rest, they find protection, they find value. They're close to the voice of their shepherd. There's intimacy. What a beautiful thing as we think about this idea of the sheepfold. And you know, the beautiful thing, what Jesus speaks to in this passage is the Jews, again, were assuming they were the only chosen people. That somehow this Jesus, this teacher, this prophet, He's messing things up because he keeps speaking against what they're trying to do. They're trying to build their flock. And he's speaking into it saying, it's not your flock. It's my flock. I am that one gatekeeper and I am that one shepherd. So as we move away from the sheepfold and back out into the valley, we ought to think what life is like outside the sheepfold. And I think a way that mimics and mirrors the very lives we live today, the world we live in. You see, I think the world to those sheep, if we think about sheep, and maybe even if we think about ourselves, 
in these few points. The world is broad and wide. So many opportunities. And in a way, we as individuals have opportunity to pick and choose at the values we like, the things we trust, the things we hope in, the next best opportunity. And I think in a way, Jesus is speaking into that human nature, that tendency that without him, without his protection, we are those sheep that will tend to wander, looking for the next best opportunity, for the next brighter green clump of grass. This is good, but over there I see a little bit bigger chunk, and we just wander. And that's the reality. And danger lurks over. He talks about the wolves in the distance. Jesus speaks to the reality that this world is a precarious place. It's a dangerous place. Satan and, and the things of Satan lurk in the distance. What do they tend to try to do? To lure us away from the shepherd. To take us one step further from Jesus. And then once we take that step, it's to lure us one more step away. To lure us so far away that at some point, Satan's going to hope that when we look back over our shoulders, we no longer see Jesus in the distance. We've walked into a perilous place. And at times, I think, too, in our in our tendency to look for fulfillment and betterment in other things. Sometimes as danger lurks, we run. And I think this passage speaks to the fact that sometimes we run into more danger. We set aside one thing for another. So in a way, what Jesus is painting is a picture here of is without being led to the fold, without being brought in through Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, without being led into the care of Jesus, we tend to be out in the world in the midst of the danger, lost, unredeemed, and it paints a picture of a man unredeemed from sin. We just are lost. And in a way, if we think about the sheep, sheep, humans, we're kind of fickle people. You know, you have, probably there's some really, really good books that are written out there about human nature and things we tend to do and things we try to do and experience. In a way, we do have a mind of our own. It's built into us. From creation, God gave us will. God gave us volition. It's a beautiful thing, but it can be a dangerous thing. Because at times... People in the world, we, they think they know what is best. They wander from moment to moment, finding, looking for rest, for fulfillment, for full bellies. We think all the way back to the feeding of the thousands. They weren't too concerned about what Jesus actually did. They were more concerned about, when are you going to do this next? This was great. We loved the bread. And one of the first things they asked him was, Show us again. Their bellies weren't full. And scripture points to the real reality that while we're in this world, we are, we are on a journey. We are so, sojourners in a foreign land. It's just the reality of our existence in this world in this time. But Jesus is the gatekeeper. Jesus is the gate. Jesus has that entrance point into a new life. There's beauty in that, and it's being offered to us. The other thing about this is if we think of the role of the shepherd, Jesus came to be with us. Yes, it was a profession, so it's a named profession. People were shepherds. So you had to have a little bit of courage as a shepherd. You were on your own. Um, I'm, I'm sure they didn't have walkie-talkies back then. They didn't have email, texting, hey, wolf on the horizon. They were on their own. They were in charge of this flock. This flock was owned by the owner. The shepherd didn't own the flock. The shepherd remained invested in the welfare, the well-being, the help of the flock for the glory of the owner. God is the owner. Jesus here is representing himself as that true shepherd.
I'm going to look at verse 7. And this goes 7 to 10. Perfect. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, there's that phrase again, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Here he names the religious leaders as the thieves. As, I st as he stood before them, he names them, calls them out for what they really are. They're the thieves that he talks about in this passage. And Jesus basically is acknowledging that God wants to call us into renewed right relationship with him. The way to do that is not through the works and the folly and the teaching of the religious leaders who sought all their way to go around and get to God. See, righteousness couldn't come through works. Righteousness only came through faith. And Jesus points to that here, that the only way to restoration to this place with God is through me. And I thought about this, you know, I think in the world today, there's so many people, we are off grazing on other things. We're just out there in the world, finding our place, finding our purpose, setting values. They have no kingdom value. The kingdom value that he's talking about here is simply put your faith and trust in me. Enter, come into what I'm offering you. See, and the other beautiful thing about this is in this passage, we see Jesus leading, not coercing. And the other beautiful thing that comes out in this passage is Jesus is not forcing us through him. He's offering. He's behind us. He's in front of us, calling out to us. He's around us. His presence is encouraging and calling us into this relationship with him. So there's beauty in that while people out in the world are off grazing in other things, finding value in other things, his voice can still be heard in the distance. And he calls to each one of those people, come to me, come to me. If we think about this reality that Jesus is the only way to full restoration before God, that's what Scripture keeps telling us. Through the Gospel of John, that's what Jesus keeps showing us, that I am the only way. What does that mean for us? It means that when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, we move into that place of protection, of rest, of restoration. I can only imagine those sheep out on the range, and we, we picture Western movies from our day where you've got herds of sheep floating around and everything seems good. To those sheep out in the valleys, they often wandered. They were often alone. They were often looking for the better things. Their true peace really only came when they were back in the fold. And that's what Jesus is trying. If you want peace, if you want restoration, it's through me and with me and nothing else. And really, it brings us to a place of living in a new way with a new purpose. So one thing I thought about here is I, I went through this passage that maybe doesn't get touched on enough is think about what's mentioned in here the thieves and the robbers, and some will try other ways. As I process that, and I process people I interact with and the communities we live in, we live in multiple communities, not just big flats. We live in our own community. But in the very communities we live in, Jesus' voice 
is going out to each person in those communities. Just like sheep, many people are out trying to find their own ways, probably with not much success. Money fails, belongings fail, relationships can fail, ideologies can fail, things we trust in can fail. And when they don't find fulfillment, they go to the next thing. And they go to the next thing. And I thought about this passage as we here as believers now sit this morning and process what does this passage mean to us? What I think it really means is we have a lot of work to do in a good way. We're not Jesus. We are not that singular pathway to God. That's Jesus's and his alone. He is the only way to full restoration. But isn't it a beautiful thought that as we are in ministry to the people in our lives, family, friends, community, strangers, think about all the people down south right now that set aside what they are normally doing in value to place themselves in a place that is not comfortable, that may not have power, that may not have water, that may not have roads, that may not have beds to sleep on. Yes, they're going there to serve, to do works of their hands, but isn't it a beautiful thing that they're showing who Jesus is? And I'm sure there's lots of opportunity for them to share their testimony and story. But that's the power of the opportunity we have. We know that around us, people are walking lives that aren't productive. I came that they may have life. We focus on that. Jesus brings life. The rest of the sentence, the phrase says, and to have life abundantly. That is what Jesus offers to us. Why wouldn't we want to help offer it to others? Why wouldn't we want to be out in the world pointing people to Jesus saying, I have this new life. I live this mystery of this abundant life. I feel it. I sense it. I feel God's presence. I reap the benefits of my relationship with him. I find protection. I find separation from the world. I know I am a different person. Why would we not want to take that to the world around us, those people, and say, I can't get you to heaven, but I can show you the person. I can introduce you to that person who can bring you to the new life I'm experiencing. Be a part of my fold. I value you. God values you. I want you as a part of the same family I'm a part of. And I think that's the biggest lesson that comes out here because I think the danger and what I'll close with here, and I think I'm saying this honestly and truthfully, right? So don't take this, don't take offense at this because I say it. But I think there's some reality to ask the question, Are we the hired hand? You see, we're going to look at verse 11. And I'm going to read 11 through 13. And this is what it says. Think about this, the hired hand. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and carries no cares nothing for the sheep. The religious leaders, with their ears now pierced open, hatred is growing at Jesus. They've decided this man needs to go away, and we will find a way to do it. He speaks so bluntly and truthfully to them. Those, the hired hand, that's them. You claim to care about God. You claim that you have a pathway to God but it's not the right pathway. And he, in fact, says, you hired hands will be the ones that will flee. You care nothing for the sheep. And as I read that, I think it's an honest question to ask ourselves sometimes. We are the sheep. 
We are part of the flock. As believers, we are the flock of God. Jesus is our true shepherd. We worship one God. The, the global church, the big C, is a collection of the smaller bodies. Just as the gate is wide and allows opportunity for so many different flocks to exist. Those are all truths. But as we function in the world, as we step out into mission to the world, we, we are called in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples. It is clear. There's no gray line. There's no ifs and buts. There's no, it's for them, but not for me. As believers, we are called to go and make disciples. So one of the questions I thought of as I process this is, are we acting as the hired hand? Are we acting as that person that's leading people to Christ? Because the difference is sacrifice. You know, we, we've heard before, take up your cross and follow me. We all have crosses to bear. We know being a Christian in this world will bring contention, division. People will disagree with us. People will argue with us. But are we that person that's going to stand our ground and say we know what we are called to and unapologetically share the truth of the gospel with a world that needs to know? Why do we say it? To offend people? No. We say it because Jesus is reaching out for each one that is lost. It would be tragic if I walked life deciding who the one was and who the one wasn't, evaluating people for I think they'd be a good Christian. Oh, I, th I think they've got the seed started. I have no idea. I'm called to lead all the people around me to the truth of the gospel. And I think that's, and then stand my ground and be present with them. And we think about discipleship. Not only do we lead people to Jesus, we stand beside that person. And do you know what that might mean? That might mean for the rest of our lives, we walk with that person in relationship because we love them and we care for them and we're honoring the fact that Jesus has called them to the fold. Now, maybe it doesn't work out that way, but I think unfortunately, sometimes in the world today, out of convenience or inconvenience, we say, oh, we, we, we're going to share the gospel with this person and we're going to give them three months. We're going to give them six months. We're going to give them a year. I can give them one hour a week. That's all I've got. That is not what this talks about. That is so nearing us to the hired hands. And I say that truthfully because if, we don't, if we're not willing to invest in the one with everything we have, the wolves in the distance are going to try to tear us from that person so that they once again walk in lostness. So I think the beauty of this passage, we hear this passage over and over, but I think the beauty of this passage is it encourages each one of us to bring people to Jesus and be that constant presence. That shepherd that's being talked about in this passage, Jesus, never left his position. Never left his position. Didn't go home for weekends. Didn't take the night off. Oh, I think my gate's sturdy. I'm going to go over and sleep under a tree. He was ever on duty. And that's what God calls us to do. And that's what rose out of this passage to me. Each one of us, we shouldn't see it as daunting. Yes, it may be. But it's a beautiful thing that God trusts us so much that we are ever on duty. And the reason we're ever on duty is to share the gospel and make disciples. And I think that's something that God is using in this passage to speak into this. And I'm going to jump to 27 to 30. So sorry, Harry, I skipped some passage. I want to read this closing. Oh, we don't. I'll read it. Never mind. Thank you. I'm going to read the closing of this passage. Listen to these words. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and I follow them, or they follow me. I give them eternal life, that they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, 
has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. What a beautiful thing that we're called into this work. We're called to be alongside Jesus as he does his great mysterious work. What a beautiful thing. So I would just encourage you today. I think it's an honest question we can ask ourselves. right? And I don't say it for criticism. I think it's good for us to wrestle with things sometimes. But one of the things we ought to ask ourselves, are we living life? Is a redeemed sheep, but acting like we're lost? There's people out there. Are we living life as the hired hand? Are we truly living life the way God intends is shown in this passage? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we give thanks for the wonderful blessing and opportunity of having been called yours. You know, so much we hear the imagery of pasture, of rest, of fulfillment, of blessing, of abundant life. We know that all this simply comes not from our works, from our own means, from our own calculations, from our own wits, from our own strengths, but it really comes to us through our weakness. That in our weakness, your son Jesus provided the final answer to this issue of being separated due to sin. Your son Jesus provided the final answer to restoration that we may be once again brought into your flock, fully redeemed, restored in relationship, in intimate relationship with you. And it is not because of us. It is because of you and the work of your son Jesus. So Lord, show us how to be faithful servants. We are called to simply go and make disciples. It's an active verb. It doesn't end. Show us what that looks like. Show us those steps. And in the meantime, help us first learn to be stronger in who we are, but then also let us fully rest in who you are and enjoy the benefit and the blessing of relationship with you. We give thanks for all these things in your name. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior. The Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again, I give my life to follow, everything I believe in, now I surrender, Say Shine your light.
to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name Speak the name of Jesus. 
us over every heart and every mind because i know there is peace within your presence i speak jesus isn't it exciting we have work to do I think it's a great thing. I think it gives us purpose and uh, position in the world. And uh, I'm going to close with my benediction. I'm going to share a simple prayer. This is what it says. God of grace, no one is beyond the reach of your love or outside your limitless mercy. Move us toward those the world despises and the people reject so we may venture to follow Christ and risk showing his love. Stand with those who are outcasts, strengthen them in peace, Encourage them by your presence and use them to build on the cornerstone of Christ until differences are honored and respected and all people together give you glory. Amen. Uh, Tracy has a short announcement and then Chris is going to come up. Okay, if you were here last Sunday, you heard about the leaf raking service project we have coming up. So it's two Saturdays away. Um, we are joining with the Scout Pack that meets here at our church to do a service project with them, basically in our neighborhood. We're, we're hoping to hit, you know, like walking distance, okay? Um, we are going to meet a little bit before 2 o'clock and spend about two hours out in the neighborhood, hopefully. Hopefully the leaves will fall by then. If not, we'll find some other way to help them clean up the yard a little bit. Um, I'm going to start getting flyers together um, to walk through the neighborhood. So next Saturday, if you want to join me, I know at least Katie's walking with me, um, we're going to walk around, distribute flyers, and I'll have contact information on there. Um, if everyone's too shy to contact us, that's okay. We're still going to walk the neighborhood, and if we see leaves on the ground, we're going to knock on the door and ask permission to break their leaves up for free, you know. Um, and then we're going to meet back here at the church at 4 o'clock and do a little campfire with the scouts. We're going to do hot dogs and s'mores and cocoa, maybe cider. I don't know. We'll see how that comes together. Um, so I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet. I'm just wondering who can commit to helping with raking. Okay. Um, we also need somebody to build the fire about an hour before we get back, get the fire started, get some chairs set up. Um, and there's some supplies at the bottom that aren't quite full yet. We need some lawn bags and we need cups. And I'm, and I'm wondering if, may, I don't know how many people here, I want styrofoam cups because they're a whole lot cheaper than those coffee cups they're selling. But you know, you can't buy styrofoam cu cups in New York anymore. So do we have somebody, you know, I, I was wondering how many Pennsylvania people we have. Can you still get it down there? All right. Well, if you want to put your name on the line for styrofoam cups, that would be a big help. Um, I'm going to pass this around while they finish announcements. Tuesday, we also have a compost run. You can't get the stuff to the compost facility till Tuesday. So if you have a truck, that'd be great. Um, so I'll pass this around. Thank you. So for the Big Flats Food Pantry... We are collecting canned yams and what was the other thing? Creamed corn. So no longer baked beans. Canned yams and creamed corn. Creamed corn. Not canned corn. Creamed corn. Yes. I don't know. Kathy, creamed corn in the corn muffin mix is really good, right? <laughs> We are, since we're talking about food, we are having lunch after church, so stick around. If you didn't bring anything, that's okay. There is always more than enough, and we're like, what are we going to do with all this leftover food? So please, help us eat all the leftover food and stick around. We have plates, we have cups, we have silverware, everything's good. Are there any other announcements?
um, that's really all I had for today. Oh, wait, there is something else. Uh, at the session meeting, we've started talking about things like committees, how they work, uh, and we decided that we really needed to have a facilities, whether you call it a committee or a team, but there's a lot of projects around the church that need done. You know, uh, minor repairs, maybe some not quite so minor. We need a, a team of people that are willing to get together and first create the list of everything that needs to be done, then prioritize that list, and then assign people within the, the team or peoples to work together on it. For one thing, we need to communicate better as a group uh, because sometimes people think, oh, I saw something, I had to go fix it, and they buy all the stuff to go fix it, and they come into the church and like, oh, wait, somebody already did it, right? We, we need to communicate better about things like that. We need to make sure we're working on the most important things um, first. Um, and so having a team that's working from a list and assigned people on that list is important. So if you um, are interested in joining the facilities team, uh, we would ask that any repairs around the church, though, go through the facilities team. Don't just take it on yourself to come in and, and fix something, right? Make sure it's something that's on the list, it's on the higher priority of the list, uh, and that we're getting through those things, right? So that's the first thing that we're working towards. Um, but let us know if you want to be part of that team. And we're, it'll be like probably a week or so to get that team up and running. All right. Let's set up for lunch. <laughs>